Hey, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit. And I'm Tracy Hazard, and today we're going to talk about use cases in blockchain. And, I, you know, this came to me as a tweet, Monica. So I got, um, I wrote an article about Sherry Ami, who we did, a, we did an, I did an interview with, and we put on the podcast. And um, I did a, an Inc. article follow-up from it, because I thought she, what she had to say was really interesting about innovation and blockchain and, and how it can grow and other things like that. And in the article we mentioned, and in a couple of articles recently mentioned food chain as a use case, you know, where you're talking about spoiled foods and how we can get it out of. It's just a really common one. Most people have acceptable understanding of it. So I use it a lot. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. It's a very easy one to use. It's an easy one, right? Because almost everybody consumes food. So <laughs> yeah, right. And so not everybody buys real estate and not everybody does, you know, uh, some of the other things, but I just wanted, so that's why I use that one very commonly. And of course it's a really short article. So it's not like I could go into all the different uses, but somebody tweeted back to me and said, Hey, what are other use cases besides food? Like what are other innovative use cases of blockchain? And I thought, Oh, wow. Well, I can think of a few and some of the people that I've either written about or been on. So I mentioned three of them. I mentioned Borsetta. So looking at luxury goods, um, I think that that was really interesting um, because those luxury goods have such high fraud factor to them. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. So that one was a really good use case study, I, I thought. Um, the other one, obviously, uh, you know, there's, there's some of the cases of blockchain of which we need to pay employees all over the world in different currencies and other things. And the one that um, brought that up to my attention and I was like an aha because it solves a complete problem in my business was Je Jessica Verstig of Paragon Coin because she has people all over the world that she has to pay developers and all of these things. And so she writes out one you know, essentially makes one transfer and now everybody gets paid in the currency of their preference. Right. And I was like, oh, that's such a, a financial management, yeah. business management issue. Like those yeah. two were just like really big ones that stood out in my mind. What about some that you've come across? I have come across, so I love the idea of the different types of social impact that can come from blockchain. So I love that uh, some, um, gosh, which country was it that recently had a local election enabled by blockchain? Um, oh gosh, I don't remember, but yeah, right. I heard about yeah. that. Yeah, it was so amazing. And I was like, this is exactly what we need, a digital identity, fraud proof on the blockchain. There's no voters, you know, voter tampering. Done. Done. Yeah. Like, and you know what? That was the second question. So after I pushed out to this, this uh, Twitter follower, a couple of use cases, they asked me about government uses of it. Uh -huh. So, you know, so that's a really good, you know, organized government use of it. Absolutely. I mean, I put in my book just the ima massive amount of uh, money that goes missing in the Department of Defense alone on an, an annual budget base basis. It's just gone. And so, you know, I can see why there's more than just, you know, a fear and the need for, for regulation that would make a government such as the United States and many others uh, push back and say, we don't want this. This kind of technology isn't good because it really pushes accountability and it gets rid of all this, you know, this idea where we, we see that there's, there's somehow fat everywhere. Well, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder when you can't lose any money, when it's right, not lost at all. I think that, that you're pointing out some of the best use case studies are coming from fraud and fat and, you know, exactly. and, uh, and in labor intensiveness in sort of the process of checking, tracking, or fi finding funds or, you know, right. multiple transactions. Like when you have to do many of those things, you want to have that you want to have that automated, but you also want to have it automated in a trustworthy way. Right. And so, exactly. you know, and that's where I think we're seeing some of them come through. So one of the areas that I'm privy to um, is labor trafficking. Uh-huh. So you're thinking about, um, and it's a combination of both how things get paid, how contracts happen, and how money is dispersed. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's like kind of an interesting thing. So labor trafficking, for those of you who don't know, I'm out here in California and in California, we have a very large, uh, uh, construction business and clothing businesses that, that have developed around. So we have us denim, uh, mm -hmm. Los Angeles is a hotbed for us denim. We also have a high amount of construction industry because we construct here year round. And in that case, we're building a, a um, we're building the new Charger Stadium, and I forget what the other team that's going to be using it is. We're getting yeah. two LA teams, so two wow. football teams are going to be using the same stadium, and so, um, so we've got two LA teams, and they're building a whole new facility, a whole new a, a compound in a way of what it is, and that kind of very very large construction also has 
a high labor trafficking and fraud. And so here's something. So my dad has always worked in the in oil and gas industry and built uh, pipelines and other things in in different places around the world. So they've had to combat fraud in a in a on the ground for a very very long time, and it's extremely hard in the construction industry because. You have essentially maybe day laborers or you have a contract, you use a subcontractor and you don't know where they get their laborers from. Right. What you can't be sure of in the process and the way U.S. law is written is that if you do not pay those laborers and they don't receive the full value of their services, then you have stolen, you have stolen goods at the end of the day. Wow. You have committed labor trafficking, yes, but you've, but the result of that, the pair of jeans is stolen goods because you stole somebody's labor to make those. Oh. And so even though many, many brands, and, and as my dad pointed out in this construction industry, you would pay someone whether or not those funds got down to the laborers was always a question in the back of your mind. Did that happen? Am I sure about it? Is this person trustworthy in the process? And how do I ensure that those laborers are getting their funds? Right. And so they used to go on the ground in, in places all around the world in Africa, which was where I lived with my father when they were building the Sasso pipeline in, in, um, in South Africa. And this was in the late 70s. So there was like zero trust, zero stuff going on. They would actually hand out the wages person to person at that time. Yeah. But what you don't know in a labor trafficking world is then do they go around and hand it back to someone who brought them into that right. country and now they're, they're, they're essentially giving away back half their wages because they're being held hostage. Right. And so this is what's going on. And so how can we ensure that they're getting their money at the end of the day? So right. there's a lot of work being done on the blockchain of both trafficking, watching hot heat mapping and watching the trafficking and the hotbeds of projects and places in which it's occurring and watching and mapping the people and subcontractors around it, both mm -hmm. in the clothing industry and in the construction industry. Isn't that cool? Okay, like they're so watching transfers of money because we're putting them on the blockchain and they don't even know it. Okay. So you, I mean, we, it's so funny because my mind just jumped so far away from this whole use case in blockchain to this. <laughs> Think about, I mean, the fact that somebody's going to get paid and you're, you're responsible for transacting directly to them. And that's kind of where your responsibility ends. But let's right. think about the entire ecosystem here. The person who's brought into a country and then now they owe half their wages to the person who brought them there. And then, so they make a choice to then go and basically buy their freedom back by spending half of their wages right. over again, right? Okay, but what about the person, and this isn't like, this is off topic from, from trafficking, but it is about, you know, what, what responsibility are we trying to track and trying to influence when we talk about how people spend their money for the betterment of their lives, right? Like, um, I recently read a thing about um, obesity rates and, and poverty, and parent, parenting tactics. There was a person who did this, this research on how upper middle class white parents and lower class uh, or working class white parents. They just like they try to do everything as equal as possible, just discuss class and how health decisions were made around food. And what they came up with was both parents, both sets of parents are dying to please their children and make them happy. And there's nothing like saying, you know, having to say no to your children and just because you can't give them what they want. And the, of course, the poorer uh, parents ran into that scenario more often. So it wasn't like a, a bike for Christmas or a car for the 16th birthday or any of that. So they found that the reason why, um, one of the reasons in this study, at least why these parents were making the decision to give their children unhealthy food was that it was one reward that their children asked for that they could afford. Mm, and interesting. So all parents wanted to do that. But the parents who had more means would be like, absolutely not carrots and celery only for you because we're going to go and have a great educational experience or we're going to go and ride horses or we're going to go have after school programming. And so, that's, so, yeah, I, I could, say that as my cushy daughter is getting a reward for working her butt off in school and really, um, making sure she didn't have any missing assignments. And I'm about to go take her after this, after this interview and after what we record here, I'm about to go take her to get a pedicure. A pedicure go. at nine years old, right? So how right. cushy is that? You know? Right. Super <laughs> cushy. Right? You're right. Rewarding experiences. We have the opportunity to do that, but I can go, oh, no chocolate for you for dinner. Exactly. Um, you know. Or you know what? No, we're not going to stop at McDonald's. That's, it's not even food. 
you know? <laughs> so the idea that yes. making decisions around their value systems of reward and what makes their life better for their children and for themselves. And when somebody comes and enters a country and under, you know, there's already such an inequality that they're trying to battle by even making that move. And then they now either have a headhunter. I mean, think about like manpower. It was the, isn't it yeah. still the largest labor source? It's the largest company, a service-based company in the world is manpower. And I think so, yeah. They just basically place people and take a cut of your of your wages over and over and over and over, right? Yeah. So they've aggregated and they have they have so many contracts that they can put you in and take a piece of your wage right there, right? And, but the, but the deal is different in this case because the wages you're paid the minimum wage, right? Or you're paid the wage for your yeah whatever whatever job you're filling, like it's a categorized wage, and their percentage is on top of it, and that corporation knows they're paying that and that's what happens in the labor trafficking in, in the, specifically in the denim industry and 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 things like that as I because I have a background in product. so what we see happen is is that you're paying top dollar wages and they're being told that this is the labor rate for l a and this is what you're paying, and this is right. what happens and you hire a production manager who you're paying a good amount of money to. And it is usually that production manager who's corruptly hiring through other agents, through agencies that are not reputable, and, and they're it. throwing him a kickback. Right. So he's making more money even on top of it, and you're already paying top dollar, which is hard enough to compete in the, in yeah. the denim industry by making U.S. goods. Like, it's all wrong in the whole process of it, oh, and it's so wrong. It's actually making the whole thing cross more, which exactly. is why you can see blockchain coming into it going – Smart contracts, I want to make sure you're not going to get paid on your smart contract unless you, you've demonstrated through the blockchain that every one of your workers got their wages. Now, right. it, what they do with that after, yeah, I don't know that we're going to be able to control that. But, but the I, more and more we see more of these decisions being logged and socially verifiable and like very public, the more we see transparency in all aspects of our global economy, the more we're going to see disparities issues that are very, very clear to us what is actually going on underneath that and what we can actually do about it rather than just be like, well, I don't know, $5 in New York is different than $5 a day in India. Like those questions are going to go away when we start to see more unifying currencies, more uh, transparent activities. And then I, I I just feel like this is the type of technology that's going to truly revolutionize the way that we are going to interact on a social and a socio-political level. I mean, yeah. once we really see what is informing disparities issues, we're not just, we, first of all, we won't be able to just throw up our hands and say, it's not my problem, I don't know. Yeah. Secondly, it's not going to be so complicated that we can't see very directly how we are a part of this problem and how we can be a part of the solution. Yeah. I just so, think the clarity is yeah. going to be so much, so much easier to ascertain. Right. And, and, you know, and this is just like, there's a lot of this use case that's happening on, I'm going to call it on the mundane um, document check kind of level. So, yeah. you know, one that I saw recently is that there's a company that that you can put your certifications through. So they will contact and get the certifications from whatever agency, whether it might be that you need a food safe certification for a restaurant or you need a, a nursing certification from wherever you went to school or whatever, whoever you got your most current updated training in. And, um, you know, or something as small as being able to make sure that you got your certification for, um, you know, uh, being able, being a lifeguard. Something like well, that, Or maybe right? we can stop having ta taxi drivers be like, you know, certified doctors in other countries and they come here and they can hardly even drive a car. Right, exactly. So right? the documentation and certification so that then an agency who's hiring all of them or a manpower who's going to distribute them all can have a quick verifiable check. It makes it really easy, really simple. It's coming straight from the source back in yeah. through and, and through the blockchain and into them. And so you only, the only thing you have to do is just go say, here's where my, here's where I got it from. And here's where I'd like it to eventually be sent to. And then from that point forward, it's now it's automatically there. And right. anytime you need it, you can access it again as the user. So you're now in control of your data too. Right. And right. your documentation, Absolutely. which I think is really important, right? You're in control, so none of that. But so it oh. helps with that, that process. And I thought, well, that's small, but it's so important. But you, okay, you talked about people using, owning their data. There's a really interesting um, project, and I hope to interview the, the, one of the founders. She's a friend of mine, uh, Tony Lancasterly. She's one of the founders of Culture, and it is bringing digital identity to the blockchain. So um, what she's doing, one of, the, one of the examples that she gave, we were on a panel together at this conference over the, over the weekend, um, and she, the example she gave was, okay, so in which one is it? Uganda, where they have the anti-gay 
law. Like straight up, they'll just come and imprison you and kill you. Like that's it. So if, if, they, if your villagers, if, if people in your village find out you're gay, you're dead. Right. If but they find out you're in love or you're a couple, you're dead. And so, um, or imprisoned at least. So she was like, but if you were to ever, if you, so you certainly do not want to have the local government know anything about your marital status if you have a gay marriage. But you may totally need to have the hospital in London when you go there and one of you is dying to know that you were married 20 years ago and you've been together that long. So what about the safe repository of your personal data up for a digital identity that's a global you know, um, trust enabled and stateless identity? What about stateless government? So not just right. governmental applications, but, but sans government applications, beyond government applications. So being able to say, here's my repository of all of my passport information, of my marriage status, of who gets who my will, of you know, my, my last uh, wishes, my, my health, you know, my, my power of attorney. All of that should only be ours. And why on earth would, you know, in some environments such as Uganda with gay, with gay marriage, it's, it, you're in peril if you let them know. But there's right. so many other use cases and times where you need to let someone know and it must be verifiably yours. So um, I think there's just a really beautiful case to be made for a post-governmental global citizenry enabled by the blockchain and digital identity. Right. Talk so, about so what are some other off. use cases <laughs> that you, you think um, are up and coming and that really demonstrate utilizing the blockchain well? Because I think that that's the thing is like blockchain seems like a catchphrase, right? It seems right. like the trendy thing to do. Oh, we're on the blockchain. But you know what? It's not right for every. And there are use cases that are really demonstrating it's a perfect blend of that need and ability to innovate in service. Right. That's true. So I think that, you know, when we talk about blockchain, we're saying that it's when my, my cousins ask me, what is blockchain? I say it's Instagram without the delete feature for PDFs, money and transactions. Right. And they're like, uh, what do you mean? I'm like, it means that there's no one place and you can't hack everyone's phone at the same time and take that picture down. And you can't take that PDF down. You can't take that information down. And what that means is all of us together are stronger than any single database alone because we're unhackable, because we're linked together. So first of all, the fact that we're making technology that requires us being linked together, philosophically just says so much about where we are as a global consciousness. I'm amazed but about that. Also, aren't we a little bit of Snapchat in there and that we can like let somebody come in and then take them right out. So like we don't have to let them have access all the time. So we're like Instagram, like you have followers and they always know you're, what you're posting and what you're doing. So you can let people in and let, or take them out, kind of Snapchat like. <laughs> what do you mean? Okay, so tell me more about your analogy with Snapchat. And tell so, me, tell me. Yeah, so I'm saying like, look, I don't want, as you put it, I don't want everyone to have my information about my, my, marital, my marital status or my, mm -hmm. I don't want everyone to see my passport, right? I mean, I just don't only really want to oh, share. Oh, it's not that everything is seen by everyone. It's just is sitting in that repository that it's when you go that to that repository, and that's where Instagram is very visual. So that's why I wanted to kind of make that, that shift uh, in the thought process is that saying, it's not that it's visually out there, it's available and it's there, right. but you're going to snap someone in and take them out when they need okay. when you. So need how about this? And you're going to make that choice. Or not. it's kind of like time capsules. Did you ever do that as a kid? You like buried the thing for in 2030, they're going to dig it up and it's going to be like a VHS tape or something. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, you know, we probably contributed to this, but I don't remember ever digging one up. So <laughs> no, we never dug one up because people 50 years before us didn't Forget do it. it. Yeah. People now aren't doing it. So like, I'm sure it was just fad and like people are going to be over it. They'll never get dug up. Right. But it's like putting something in that place where you know it's safe. And the, the metaphor here is not about the location of being it buried in, one, just, in just one place. It's the metaphor for like where it's in, it's in this entire system, but it is like obscured so that it takes you unlocking it. And so you can't put something there that's encrypted, totally and completely encrypted in a way that nobody can hack it. No one can get in there and change the amount of money in your bank account. No one can go in and change. I think that that's where the blockchain starts falling apart for a lot of people. A lot of people who are maybe not in the industry and not in the know about how it works and what it does because we don't believe in unhackable anymore. Right. Like that, we've lost trust in unhackability, right? Right. Because of how things work. And, you know, and, 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 real respects, like, I mean, I, I hear it all the time. It's kind of a condescending thing that happens in the security part of our, as we build our companies and our businesses. And they're like, well, that's all of our users fault because they can't, they can't make good passwords. And right. I like, no, it's not. It's your fault. Right. It's our fault for building a, a system that couldn't be secured in a way that was, was capable of being done by human nature. Right. Exactly. And 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, no, like, we can't remember so all those numbers. <laughs> yeah, this is so much further and more advanced than that, that it's like really fantastic. And I mean, yes, if, if you put too many layers of interface over something that's just like raw data that will just hold something, yes, you could end up, you know, like the uh, passphrases you could potentially memorize someone's passphrases and potentially begin to hack into their into their wallet. You know, there's still a way that it could be done. It's just so much harder. And what and if it was to happen, you would see it exactly what happened. It's not like you had your Chase account, you know, like hacked into and then it went to some like Swiss bank account and then it disappeared. It's like every single wallet that it transfers to is seen on that blockchain, right? So right. so it makes it it makes it um, a deterrent to hacking. Right. Right, yeah. because you're going to. There's no way to cover your tracks from, from the moment that you hack into something. Yeah, if it's on the blockchain, that that's absolutely true. And so I think that 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 leads to a new trust economy. Really, that's right. where people can go. Oh, I can trust that this is gonna. This is bigger than me. It's in a situation that's larger than just one database. If someone makes friends with the CEO and hacks into it, or like someone gets his personal log into the system and the database of Chase Bank, they can take your money. Yes, they yeah. can. The federal government might insure it to a certain point, but not all the way. You know, not if you have so much money. You know, I think, what, the federal government will only insure up to $250,000. So um, you, don't, you don't just have like all of the immunity in the world. So there are all of these different processes. And I think that the blockchain is, is changing, starting with banking. FinTech is huge. Insurance, really big. Because, you know, if there's so much fraud in insurance, it can get rid of so many opportunities for fraud, be a huge deterrent, um, and make things so much more efficient. Like, that's why real estate's a no-brainer. Because think of how much money it costs you to buy and sell a home. I mean, it costs you a ton. And think of how many times you've lost your deposit when really you didn't cause any damage. I mean, just that alone, there's so many opportunities for this very big power imbalance to occur where basically your, 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 your contracts are only as good as your ability to lawyer up and afford a lawyer to, to enforce them. And with a smart contract, enforceability is now democratized. What does that mean? It means it's not finally with a smart contract, it's not fundamentally more expensive to be poor than rich. It's right. actually the opposite. It's finally the same. And that's all I think the working person's asking for on, on a global scale is like, can we just not always have the starting line somewhere else for those of us who didn't start out with any amount of privilege, whether it's geographic privilege, racial privilege, class privilege, can we just have the starting line be kind of more equal and then see what happens with all this amazing human resource and potential when people get the chance to compete on fair pl playing ground. And I think that blockchain has the potential if it doesn't get centralized and put into the hands of too few, I think it really has the ability to, to take us to a new place that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there are so many use cases that are coming up and they're popping up left and right and you go, wow, problem that needed solving. And, you know, yeah. whether or not blockchain was the answer to it, you know, it, it may it's emerging as going to actually be easier to execute it that way. And that's why I think people are adapting to, because we have had this problem, these problems in these areas for a very, very long time. For sure. So our good friend, Ju Juliet Clark, um, who is a super brand publishing, and she is in this publishing world in this whole thing where there is just complete distrust and disgust with the book publishing market, which I know you now know well, right? Yes. And how you get on the New York Times bestseller list and how you get on the USA Today and the whole thing's all hackable. Yeah, it's all it like is. it's all you know corrupt in the process, and so she was she's been researching and looking in and and excited that we started this podcast because it meant that she would have a vehicle for exploring more along with us. Exactly, that is you know how can that be changed, and is there an innovation here that I can participate and be a part of because I care about this being because this has been happening for a hundred years or decades or whatever it might be. Yeah. I want to affect the difference. I want to affect the change. And, you know, this is partially why when I first saw blockchain and what's going on here, I was like, I get it immediately because I, I see the problems. I see the problems of regular contracts, of, of escrowing, of uh, letters of credit and all of those things when you process goods across countries. Mm -hmm. And smart contracts is completely the answer that's been, we've been waiting for. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we uh, touch on this because depending on who we're, who's listening, smart contracts, will you define that? 
on your terms because yeah, so, I know it better than you do, but yeah, you on my terms. So, so here's the yeah. thing. So I'm going to buy, I'm going to place a purchase order to buy a whole bunch of pens, right? It could be, you know, any goods that I'm going to buy over in Asia. I'm going to buy it in China. I'm going to place a purchase order with this factory and I have a contract that's completely unenforceable today. Okay. Because it, I am only allowed by it, it, for that contract to be enforceable if I sign it in Chinese. And how can I be totally sure that the translation of it and the understanding of it is matched to my understanding? So I can put it in two languages, but at the end of the day, only the Chinese version is enforceable with the factory. So basically yep. I'm signing something to make sure we're clear on it, but I know it's unenforceable and I can't afford it anyway, even if I try to. Right. So they could cheat me, right? It can exactly. happen. And that's why there's this kind of, adversarial relationship with our factories, which I don't believe in. And so I go there in person because now that they see me and know me, they're more likely to trust me and I'm exactly. more likely to trust them. That's how I've changed it in the way that I work because this paper is worth nothing. So I place this purchase order against it. I buy, I'm, I'm buying these goods. I pay 30% to 50% down depending on your arrangement with them. And the remainder of it is waiting in an, a letter of credit from the bank. So the bank has to get the that the goods are completed but here's the problem what does the bank know about whether or not it's a good pen at the end of the day did they make what i asked them to did they follow the contract the bank knows you ordered 10,000 and 10,000 and are finished like right, there exactly. isn't any smart people in that process who get a say in the process there right. you know i might there's no verifiability it's there's no fair. verifiability i might hire an inspection agency in the process but you know, but the bank may not even may even ignore that and release the funds. And so at the end of the day, I've had so many people who've, who've not done it in a, in a verifiable and smart way. And in right. the end of the day, their goods came to shore and they go, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I and bought. I'll never get my money back. And I'll never get my money back because it's, and right. so that's where we want us. We want checkpoints along the smart contract way. It's like, I want my inspection agency to sign off on it. And then maybe the bank has their own and okay, that's fine too. And you know, and you want to go through that process of having all of those people and no funds are released until all of that happens. Mm -hmm. And I, and I say, go. Right. Right. And so and at the that, very end, you still have the opportunity to say yes, no, right? right. And then the transaction completes. Right. right. But once you set it up and put it into the system, it's kind of like an escrow. It's moving through it if, the, if they say it's done because that's the process that's set up. It's right. not set up to be verified by me or anyone else in that process. It's not set up that way. And so that's where smart, smart contracts I see are going to come on as a layer of multi-step verification throughout the mm -hmm. process. And enforceability. Um, enforceability, but also so that it can do disparate payments. So maybe I have a smart contract. So maybe on my podcast platform, I might take a big advertiser who wants to spend a hundred thousand dollars, but that advertiser doesn't want to shell out $10,000 to this podcaster and a thousand dollars to this one. They want to get as many views, listens, whatever it is that they're contracting for across the demographic, across the topics or across whatever they want, but they want to write out one check and we want to be able to disperse it in a smart way to all of the different people who verify, whose verifiable information are able to come back and say, yep, I did get a thousand listens and here's the proof of it because my data is automatically trans transferred within the blockchain. Right. And now I know, and now I'm going to get my thousand dollars out of that hundred thousand dollar pool and somebody else going to get their 10 and the, everyone's happy. Podcasters right. are getting paid and the brand's happy because they wrote one check and they got the campaign that they wanted. They got the listens, they got the views, they got the, it verified at the end of the day that it actually happened instead of yep. like this, like maybe people watched it. I have an impression load. Like that's right. great. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's well, another also, way that I see that. Isn't, uh, isn't, what is it? Uh, I read somewhere, I heard from a lawyer at some point that like over 80% of law practiced is contract law. Yes. It's not court law. Yeah. So contract law is a huge part of the, of the entire, I, it's a profession, but also an industry. And to be able to productize the services, you know, it's like, I can't wait till we have an app to take care of my doctor. So I don't have to go to a doctor anymore. I have an app for that. I wish I had an app for a GP, really, honestly. <laughs> and I wish I had a smart contract or several, or I'm in a house of a little cornucopia of smart contracts for my lawyer. I just right. wish I had that. Things that were like, here you go, here's the NDA. And also if it's really important, I want you to put $10,000 into this, into this multi-sig wallet that if we verify that you've 
you know, gone against this NDA, you're automatically, that 10 grand is going to our lawyer because then he will sue you, you know, <laughs> like, and you got to put some money on the line or, you know, why can't I say, um, if I'm left alone in a room with someone who I know has a history of, I don't know, grabbing women by the pussy, uh, they have to put certain amount of money into an escrow account because I could leave that room with severe damages and I'm not going to be bothered with having to sue them for it. I will well, be bothered by you know, verifying what happens. Yeah. But I mean, just thinking about all the times we have these contracts and they're so unenforceable and they're so, right. and they, you know, that's yeah, they where I look. Yeah. And that's where I really see that the highest level of blockchain usability is going to happen is because these things are already problems today. And it's not about, oh, I I can't avail myself of of lawyers. Many, many people do. It's the part of you're disrupting my business and I'm not moving forward by having to deal with this all the time or deal with this risk level or, you know, and that's really where at the fundamental end of the day, why it's going to take hold and move fast is because it just makes more sense to make business smoother so I can get on with the stuff I need to do, not yep. the stuff that is encumbering me and, and distracting my business at the end exactly. of the day. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the use cases, they really do expand far and further and further. And I'd rather not even talk about where there's not one because I think eventually it will grow to that. I mean, just like people used to say, there's, you know, they're not an internet business. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. People weren't an internet business because there was the, uh, there was the, even just like a chance to be not an internet business. Give me a break. But yeah, I know. I was like, last year I finally had to say, yeah, I'm a digital marketing business. Technically, I'm a digital marketing business. Like, I yeah, you are. That, but that's what I am, right? You know. Yeah. And so, yeah, <laughs> I know it's we're funny. all go dragging and screaming into whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But you know, at the same time, I think as we we're just we're in the we're in the front end of a curve that's gonna just get and get more and more groundswell. So it's it's an exciting time, but it's also there's just a lot of need for education. You know, this that's is a. Right people needed to understand what the hell the internet was. And now it's like, well, there's a new one. <laughs> there's That's a new right. internet. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, well, everyone, we would love to hear your use cases. We'd also love for you to share it. If you're building a business and it's got a great application, we want to hear about it. If you're doing yeah. smart contracts, if you're doing things on the blockchain, if you're doing things with cryptocurrency, we really want to hear it, especially if you're filling this big need. This yeah, need absolutely. To move. We want to hear your story. We want to hear about your company. Uh, apply to be on our show. Let us oh, know. Absolutely. Please yeah. do. It would be great. I would love to hear more use cases for the yeah. blockchain. Yeah. That is really what I, that, that is the part that I personally want to grow in our show here. So the more people that suggest companies that are doing some great things, we can't be everywhere. Monica and I are strike pretty thin. <laughs> Although we try to be. <laughs> we try to be, but we want to hear what's out there because that we're relying on you to bring that to us. So when you're, when you're, when you're out there and you hear something, ping us. Message right. us on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Yeah. Every it is a Twitter message. That's like the best way to get through to us, I think. Yeah. At at New Trust Economy. So you can find us anywhere on social media at New Trust Economy. You can find us at newtrustaconomy.com and you can send us a message right through there if you wanted to send us a comment. That would be great too, right? Yeah. Ping us anywhere you can. And thank you guys so much for listening. We really enjoy doing the show. So this has been Tracy and Monica on the New Trust Economy.